And it's good to see each one of you here this morning. Welcome. We pray that God's richest blessing will rest upon each one here today. Up there, and I'm going to move that forward just a little bit. And I think this we can move down a little bit so that I can see out. I might even not need these. <laughs> well, I tell you, some some weeks are are challenging, aren't they? Yesterday we had uh, memorial service for uh, Barbara Jean Zumwalt, and you know it's it's sad to see someone who is such a been such a great part of the church over the years lay down their sword and rest but you know I think our scripture and I go back um, talks about when I open the graves my people I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. I am thankful that we have the blessed hope, the soon return of our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I am so thankful that when He comes on the clouds of heaven, He's coming with the trumpet of God and with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall be resurrected. And then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. That's the testimony of Barbara Jean's life. That was her hope, her blessed hope. And, and I was just, I was thrilled as I listened to the stories. I didn't get a chance to know her much. We had a prayer with her at the hospital a few days before she passed away. But, you know, what, a, what an inspiration to hear all of the remembrances of someone who was faithful until the end. Amen? Some of you may know people that celebrate Lent. But do you know what Lent is? Um, Lent is a season, and now I'm not, I'm not trying to promote Catholicism or anything like that, but I just want you, know, you to be aware, uh, this is educational. Uh, you'd pay 50 bucks an hour for this in some college course, but we give it to you for, for you know. Uh, Lent is a season of 40 days, not counting Sundays. And we could go in, into the explanation of why that is, but uh, uh, we won't today. But which begins on Ash Wednesday and ends on Holy Saturday. Now Lent comes from the... Anglo-Saxon word Lincoln, which you know it's not an easy thing to say in, in English but uh, so they kind of you know shorten it down to Lent. Uh, the 40 days represent uh, the, the word Lincoln means spring. And the 40 days represents the time when Jesus spent in the wilderness enduring the temptation of Satan and preparing to begin his ministry. And so I think that's, this, is a, this is a good thing to remember. Amen? And what did Jesus do while he was there in the wilderness? He was spending time alone with his Father, fasting and praying. He had been filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. 
And the Spirit led him into the wilderness. It was a time of special preparation for his ministry. And, I, and so I think that when we look at, at Lincoln, springtime, you know, actually Jesus didn't go into spring, but into what? Wilderness. He went into a desert. He went into a dry place. Have you ever gone through a dry experience in your spiritual life? I read a, a description uh, this week of of one individual who said that that he went through 14 years of dryness, 14 years of dryness that was so dry it felt like his prayers went from his bottom lip and hit the floor. He wasn't getting any refreshment from his Bible study. It was dry. It was horrible. Maybe you've experienced some other times in your life when everything seems dry and dead. You, you feel that you are surrounded by a great valley filled with your failed hopes and dreams. That relationship that you wasn't wanted didn't work out. You didn't get that job that you had prayed for. A trusted friend betrayed you. Someone you loved, like Barbara Jean, died. Even the wind and the weather seems to attack you and give you no rest. Some of you have weather arms and knees and backs. You know what I'm talking about. You know when that storm is coming in. And it can lay you low. I know Evangelina, she just aches all over when storms come through. And your brother Fred now has got a weather knee. He doesn't like it. Not one bit. You will live in this valley for a long time and it will seem like everyone who loves you is gone. You know, when my grandmother passed away, my grandma Bechtel, she was 99 and a half and I gave her memorial service. She was, she was a stalwart. She was, when she was converted, she, she had gone to a Billy Sunday evangelistic crusade. Uh, if you know Billy Sunday, he was he was quite a preacher. Uh, she was nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old, and uh, but the family, her her mom and dad were were Adventists. I, you see, I'm I'm sixth generation Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, we go back. Uh, through her side of the family to the early days of of the work in Michigan and uh, and when she decided to to give her life to the Lord in in Billy Sunday's meetings she upset her older brother Roy Roy was not a seventh day Adventist Roy Hackett and uh, he was a banker. He was a Presbyterian. And he thought that because he took his little sister to the meetings, that she ought to join his church. But no, she joined the Adventist church and was baptized. And, 
And when she passed away, she was one of the last people alive that had heard Ellen White preach. So she, my grandma Bechtel was was my touchstone to the to the pioneers. She knew S. N. Haskell and and John Loveborough and and all of the the different ones. I mean, she she wanted to write a book called Feet Under My Table. Because when they come to Grandma's house, she always fed them. And, and Grandma was a, was, was a great one for health. Uh, back in the early days, Dr. Brinkhouse, you'll be interested in this, uh, she worked for Dr. Jethro Klaus. You might know him. He's the one who wrote the book, Back to Eden. Uh, it's still in print. Great Seventh Day Adventist doctor. He he wrote the 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 best. It's still probably the the most complete herbal uh, reference book in American uh, herbology today. Uh, I mean, it's a standard. That's where you where you start from. Um, but when Grandma died, when she was 99 and a half, as I looked out at the congregation that day, I realized something about that experience. All of Grandma's friends had gone on before her. All of the people that she had been in the garden club with, all of her friends at the village church there in, in College Place, they were all gone. She was kind of the last of her generation. It will seem like everyone who loved you was gone. It will seem in this wilderness, this desert, like God is gone. The desert is not a friendly place. Even though it hurts to go through these desert dry conditions, it's a wonderful time of education by a loving Father God who wouldn't allow you to suffer without a good reason. Look around you at the bones of your past. You have something essential to learn. You see, God needs to show you that He can help you. And only God can work miracles. Amen? We need to remember that no matter how bad things are, God can fix them and make you better. No matter how hard you work, you can't bring the dead back to life. I met a man the other day, last month, who told me he was the most holy man on the planet Earth. Well, okay. <laughs> he says, I was killed two different times and I resurrected myself. And that was his proof of his... He said, one time I was stabbed in the heart and I was in the morgue for two days before I resurrected. I'm not sure about this man. Well, I am fairly sure about it. <laughs> but, you know, he was... He was pretty certain that that he could he could do miracles, like move planets out of the way that were on collision course with planet Earth. I still haven't verified that one yet, but 
You know, people have ideas, but we should remember that it's only God who really is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. We ask and God is the one who does them, right? It's not us. If we're puffing ourselves up and thinking that we're so high and mighty and holy, bad news for you. We might be just talking and not really living in reality. But God can bring the dead back to life. He, and He will. That's what He's promised. When Jesus comes, He will bring them back to life. God will bring new life into your failures, your deadness, and make them into the tools you need to understand and to be of help to others. And that's what it's all about. You will encounter many people lost in the desert of their past. And they will need guidance to get out. Amen? They will need someone to show them the way. And who better to guide them than you, one who has lived so long in the valley of the dry bones. It's all about helping others. I remember a book that I had recommended to me when I was going through some very difficult challenges in my young pastoral life. I'm not going to go into all the details of what I was going through, but my ministerial secretary, Elder Clarence Grusbeck, said, John, he says, I would recommend that you get this book called Wounded Healers and read it because it will help you to understand what you're going through and what God has in mind for you. You see, when, when we go through difficulties, when we experience challenges, God allows those things to happen in our lives so that we can be a healer like Jesus was. He was wounded for our transgressions. And he applies that wounding to us. He gives us His righteousness. He took our sin and, and gave us His righteousness so that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. And brothers and sisters, as you allow God to heal you, you can be instrumental in pointing them to the source of your healing, which is Jesus. And that's the only way that we are going to be able to bring people to God. Is when we allow the things that we have gone through, the hurts, the difficulties, the pains, the sorrow, the dryness, the deadness of our experience. And God brings us out on the other side. He will, he will use that for His honor and His glory to help others. But you will not be able to help them unless, unless you do have the Holy Spirit living in your hearts and minds. Last uh, month's board meeting, Dr. Bruce uh, read from this little book, uh, Power for a Finished Work by Elder J. L. Schuler, who is one of the uh, grandfathers of evangelism in the Adventist Church, a great, great evangelist. And this this little little book is worth its weight in gold. And one of the things that um, he said here, Paul declared that the life he lived was not his life. Amen? 
Not his life. But the life that Jesus lived in him. And he quotes or says, see Galatians 2.20. Now, if you've listened closely in the sermons that I've given, you will have heard that this is one of my favorite texts. Because I believe that Galatians 2.20 is a summary of the Christian life. I have been crucified with Christ. The effect of have been crucified? Dead. In other words, I am dead. I died with Christ on the cross. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And He lives in me and dwells in me. And He loves me. And I kind of got off uh, quoting it word for word, but you guys know the text, right? I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. It's His life that is lived in us. A lot of, a lot of the translations, unfortunately today, say, I live by faith in Jesus. It's not your faith, it's His faith. It's His life. It's not our life. It's His life. But we have to be dead. And how often does Paul say that we have to experience this? Daily. I die daily. And if you really want to get more specific, it's every moment of every day. Amen? I die every moment so that Christ can live. You know, when, when a coroner does an autopsy on a, on a corpse, most generally the corpse does not raise back to life. He doesn't say, ouch. He is just there. In other words, the reason I'm saying this is because we need to come to that place where we no longer have a desire or will or motivation of our own. It is a, We have to allow Christ to live in us so completely through us so that He will take complete control of our lives. Amen? Christ Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the reproduction of His character in His people. And the way that works is that we have to die daily, moment by moment, let Jesus live in us, and then Jesus lives His life in us. Amen? And when that happens, Christ will come to claim His people and take them home. Praise God for that. Amen? But you will not be able to help them unless you do have the Holy Spirit. And what I was getting to here is this quotation that he, uh, he gives from Desire of Ages, page 805. The only way any person can live a true Christian life is to let Jesus live in him or her. This can only can be true only by the continuing impartation of the Holy Spirit because, quote, this is the desire of ages, quote, the impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. When we talk about 
the early and the latter reign. We're talking about the impartation of Christ and Him taking control of us completely. Let's look at the old story there in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel was taken by Je the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was upon me and He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley. And it was full of bones. And He caused me to pass round about and behold... You know, I, as I think about kids today, uh, there is a fascination with skulls and bones and, and, and all kinds of... I, I don't understand it, really. I really don't. <laughs> but, but, you know, maybe it comes from this. I don't know. But, you know, can you imagine here Ezekiel is out in this bone patch. He caused me to pass among them round about and behold there were many on the surface of the valley and lo they were very very dry. There probably is a lesson in that. They were very dry. Dr. Brinkhouse, I'm going to pick on you now. <laughs> it's an easy question. Where's the blood created in a human body? Inside the bone. Inside the bone. In the marrow. And the blood is the source of the life in us, isn't it? It carries the ruach or the breath. It carries the, the spark of life. And Ezekiel is in this valley where the bones are very dry. Very, very dry. There's no life left in them. It had been completely drained and suck it, sucked out of them. <laughs> but at least it was a dry heat. <laughs> that was just for my fun. <laughs> They were so dry, the Lord asked Ezekiel the question, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel was pretty astute, I think. He, he gave a very good answer. He said, as he looked at the valley of the bones, Oh, Lord, <laughs> only you know. <laughs> well, I'm not going to venture to say. I've never seen a bone resurrected. And God said to him, Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones and say to them, Oh, dry bones. It's very specific. They're not the wet ones. The dry ones. Say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Well, that's kind of interesting too, isn't it? Here is a dry bone that has no life in it. How are they going to hear? Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. God's going to be doing a great miracle, in other words. I will put sinews on you, make your flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. 
somebody that brings people back to life is pretty, pretty special. Amen? So I prophesied as I was commanded, Ezekiel said. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And you know, we uh, can probably thank the songwriters and, and Hollywood for, for, for making dim bones all come together in, the, you know, the head bone connected to the neck bone and all of that. But, you know, this was a miracle. They were coming together. There was a noise. There was a rattling. And bone came together to its bone. And I looked. And behold the sinews were on them. And the flesh grew. And the skin covered them. But. There was no breath. In them. And where there is no breath. There is no life. They were just out there without any life in them. And then God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to them, prophesy to the breath. Now, when God says prophesy to the breath, the Hebrew word is ruach, meaning spirit or wind, breath. When God breathed into Adam the breath of God, he breathed Ruach into him and he became a living being. And so he tells Ezekiel to prophesy, uh, Son of man, say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds. O breath, O spirit, and breathe on these slain that they become to life. And so I prophesied that he's commanded and the breath came into them and they came to life. And they stood on their feet an exceeding great army. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. God's people. These were the bones. Where were they? In the valley of the desert. In a dry place. No life. Ezekiel's after the or during the time of the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. He's in Babylon. And it's a, it's a very serious situation that we, God is dealing with, with His people. There is no spiritual life left in them. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. And they knew it, see? They knew. This was the proverb that they were saying. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out up out of your graves and my, my people and I will bring you into the land of Israel. He's going to do a new thing. He's going to do a great miracle. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. Praise God for that. Amen. You will come to life and I will place you on your own land and then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. In the valley of the dry bones, the poet has written, everything was still and silent. The Spirit of God stirred the valley. The Spirit quickened the dry bones through the Word. The dry bones heard the Word and came alive. The wind heard the Word and came alive. From the four winds came the breath of life. 
the Spirit of the Lord God, the power of the Lord's Word, the faith in the Lord's Word, and obedience of the Lord's Word quicken the dry bone from standing still to living on. Praise God for that. Amen. Who is it that is able to join the bones save the pa that power which created them? Wrote another poet. What is it that shall reunite the shreds of the body save the hand of the maker? What is it that shall restore the form save the finger of the Creator? He who created and turned and destroyed is He that is able also to renew and raise up. Another God is unable to enter in and restore creatures not His own. There's only one and that is Jesus. He is the Lord. He is... He is the God who gives us the Spirit, His Spirit, who brings His righteousness, His character Himself. He brings God into our lives and empowers us and resurrects us and enlivens us and makes us. Ellen White has written these divine counsels. I want to... Uh, bring us down to s some application here at the end. But not only does this simile of the dry bones apply to the world, and she had been talking about evangelism, and, and you might be looking at people and you wonder, they're so in, they're, they, they, they're so dense, they have no ability to comprehend. They're, they're, they're just doesn't look like there's any hope for life in these people. But don't give up. Because God is the creator and the recreator and He is able to bring life out of inanimate objects. But this does not only apply to the, dry, to the world but also to those who have been blessed with great light. Like you and me. We've been blessed with great light. Amen? For they also are like the skeletons of the valley. We, we go through these experiences. They have the form of men, the framework of the body, but they have not spiritual life. We get that condition time. But the parable does not leave the dry bones merely knit together in the forms of men, for it is not enough that there is symmetry of limb and feature. The breath of life, which is what? The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, the breath of life must vivify, bring to life the bodies that they may stand upright and spring into activity. These bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God, and the hope of the church is the vivifying or uh, enlivening influence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord must breathe upon the dry bones that they may live. That's what we need is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God with its vivifying flat power must be an every human agent. That's pretty incomprehensive, isn't it? Encompassing. Every one of us needs the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Every spiritual muscle and sinew may be an exercise. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, it, there is torpidity. Now, Tim... I did look my word up. <laughs> it's, it's got a great... This is a great word. There is torpidity. Let me just see if I can find it. Okay, it, it means mentally or physically inactive. 
If you're mentally and physically inactive, what's going to happen to you? You're pretty dead. Right? Lethargic. Uh, it's used of animals uh, when they're dormant, especially during hibernation. You go into a long sleep. That's what torpidity is. There is a torpidity of conscience. It's not working, in other words. Loss of spiritual life. Many are without spiritual life, who are without spiritual life, have their names on the church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What is the Lamb's Book of Life? Is it just the record of those who get eternal life? No, it's not. Thank you, brother. I like that shake. <laughs> Revelation 21, 27. If you want to look at it there, you will find it says... The Lamb's Book of Life. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life get to go into the Kingdom of Heaven. Now I'm going to explain something very, very significant that I have... I've not heard anybody else explain it this way. But perhaps it's because I love Greek that I came to this understanding. When I began to translate the book of life of the Lamb I discovered it says only those whose names are written in the book of the life of the Lamb not necessarily the Lamb's book of life Do you see the difference between the two the book of life oh, the Lamb's book of life many people think contains the names of those who are going to get into the kingdom. But if your name is written in the book of the life of the Lamb, what does that mean? It means that, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, stands in your place. And when that book is opened and God looks for your name there, He doesn't look at you. He doesn't look at all the things that you have done. But He looks at the blessed Lamb of God, perfect, spotless, who died and paid the penalty for our horrible experience and life. He is... His life is what stands in our place. I would hope that everyone would have said Amen. Because that's the only reason that we are going to get into eternity with God. Is because Jesus' life stands in our place. That's what the substitutionary atonement is all about. That was proclaimed from the Garden of Eden to the cross. When you have your name written there, you have assurance. That's why it was so important for Jesus to, to get back to his dad to find out if everything was okay. Because the last thing that he remembered on the cross when he was sin. God made him who knew no sin to be sin. He was sin on the cross. And darkness covered the cross. That was Satan's territory. Amen. God is too holy to look upon sin, even if it's His Son who He told to go and become sin. God had to pull back. 
to the glee of all the hosts of hell. They, they were there telling Jesus he was forever lost. He was theirs because he was sin. He had joined them. And so on that resurrection morning, he took a few moments to comfort one of his dearest disciples, Mary the Magdalene, whom he had cast seven demons out of. And when he said her name, Mary, she says, Jesus, and she threw her arms around him. And unfortunately, the translation says, don't touch me. <laughs> I don't think that's anything close to what Jesus was saying. He was saying, don't detain me. Don't detain me because I've got to go back to my dad and see if everything worked out okay. And praise God it did. Amen? Amen. And he left her with the first commission to go and tell. Go and tell. And if you have known Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he says, go and tell what good things I have done for you. I hope that, I hope that you get the idea that the book of the life of the Lamb is so vitally important because that's the foundation of our assurance. They may even be joined to the church, but they are not united to the Lord. They may be diligent in the performance of a certain set of duties and may be regarded as living men, but many are among those who have a name that li thou livest and art dead. Unless there is a genuine conversion of the soul to God, unless the vital breath of God quickens the soul to spiritual life, unless the professors of truth are actuated by heaven-born principle, they are not born of the incorruptible seed which liveth and abideth forever. Unless they trust in the righteousness of Christ as their only security, unless they copy His character, labor in His Spirit, they are naked and have not the robe of His righteousness. The dead are often made to pass for the living. For those who are working out what they term salvation after their own ideas have not God working in them to will and to do of His good pleasure. Jesus invites us to walk the narrow way. Come, follow me. Take up your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. You see, the, the way of the cross, where does it lead? It leads home. The way of the cross leads home. And, and Jesus, the happy Jesus, is there waiting to welcome you into that eternal bliss. And friends, I hope that that every day you will you will renew your relationship with God. Renew your relationship with Jesus. Renew your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Open your, the doors of your heart and let Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit come in and, and dwell in your hearts and live in your hearts and live through your life. When that happens, every day will be a latter rain day. Let the rain fall. Come, sweet Holy Spirit, and touch our hearts, touch our lives, and make us what you want us to be. Oh Lord, 
we come to the close of this sermon and we know that it's only you it's only you that can bring salvation to our lives it's only you that that can take the dryness the emptiness that we feel and transform it into a vibrant love filled life that will touch lives for Jesus and for God so today Lord we wait we wait for the, your touch we wait for your entrance into our lives and we know that that it's a real experience Lord, we want to have that experience each and every day. So today, we dedicate ourselves to that. There may be some here who have never opened the door of your heart to God before in this way. Right now, I invite you in the quietness of this sanctuary and just open your heart. And let God have complete control. Don't be afraid. He's the, the God who loves you, who loved you so much. And he was willing to die in your place for your sins. He's the God who was willing to live a perfect life for you. And He gives you that, that life, that righteousness as a free gift. All you have to do is accept it. And so right now, just in your heart, just say, Lord, I accept Jesus. I accept His righteousness. I give you my life. With all its dryness, with all its ugliness, with all of the troubles and trials, I give it all to you, Lord. And as you do, His Holy Spirit will begin to work new life in you. The breath of God will work through every, every part of your body, every organ, every muscle, every, every little cell of your body, and you will become transformed. God will work in you and through you. To make a new creature. Behold, all things have become new. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you for this. And we glorify you now in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We are so thankful for all that he went through and did for us. And is still doing for us because he ever leads to intercede for us. And we thank you and praise you in his name.